You're listening to How I Sell, a podcast built for early career sales professionals. You'll hear stories, best practices, and guidance from top sales leaders on what it takes to become a sales superstar. Today's episode is made possible by Ramped Careers. Ramped is on a mission to build the next generation of workforce-ready talent. Today, I'm so excited to bring Scott Samios to our show. Scott is the Chief Revenue Officer at Cube. Not only is he an accomplished sales leader, but also a mentor to many promising early stage and growth companies. Scott has experience building and scaling businesses through a wide range of ex- exits, including private equity and strategic acquisitions. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. At, uh, my background sounds exciting. I'd like to do it all over again. That's amazing. For, for those who don't know you, Scott, and I know that I've gotten to know you a little bit uh, personally and professionally as well, but for those that don't know you, who is Scott Samios? Well, I'm a sales leader. So, uh, you know, I'm someone who builds teams and loves doing that. I love leadership and um, kind of uh, assembling the perfect mix of people, motivating them. Uh, at least that's, that's who I am at work. And I think um, at play, I'm kind of the same. So. would love to uh, kind of dive into that a little bit more, especially on the, you know, non-work sites. So when you say at play, I'm the same way. Are there, you know, are there things, activities that you enjoy doing that you find a lot of parallels to with sales? Well, yeah, I mean, there was a period uh, in my midlife crisis where I did triathlons and, and stuff like and marathons and stuff like that. So I guess that could be a little bit like the journey that we're on in sales, you know, with the finish line being uh, the, hitting your numbers in that's whatever a, period so <laughs> long, long journey i think the most uh the, the most i've done is a is a 10k and i was very tired at the end of it but to your point was it practice that that got you better or were you just a natural athlete going into these things no not a, a natural i mean the good thing about triathlons and marathons is you just go straight ahead and you can be as uncoordinated as you want to be um, <laughs> you just need to practice <laughs> That's amazing. You know, what we'd like to do, Scott, is to jump on a a time machine of sorts. And, you know, let's just go back in history because I'd love to hear about how you got here. Right. So we'll we'll go back into a younger Scott graduating with a degree in history. Looks like you spent some time in France and the time in college must have been a lot of fun. If you can, if you can recall, what was your thinking back then? So you graduate out of college, you have a degree in history. What did you want to do? Who did you want to become? Well, I actually went into college thinking I was going to be a computer science major. And I think after the first semester, I thought this is the most boring stuff I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, I, I you're working on big, uh, the, you know, it was before the internet revolution. So you're working on big Vax computers with you know, Fortran and these old languages that nobody uses today. Well, some people, yeah. I, I switched into history because I loved the storytelling and the, you know, the reading and writing and communication. So I did that. But when I got out of college, I came to New York in the nineties. It was just when like Mosaic and the web was coming out. And I remember I picked up the first uh, issue of Wired Magazine, which at that time there were no magazines like that. And mm-hmm. I was just blown away. This is going to be the new experience for all people on earth that, you know, having this connected internet, this connected um, system, and there's going to be a need for so much software. And so I just saw that as the coming tide rising and I wanted to jump in. I, you know, networked around, I got myself into a meeting with a founder and the founder, uh, you know, I, I said, I want to work in tech. And we had a nice meeting, but then a couple of days later, he called me and he said, there's a big trade show in Atlanta or called Comdex. Can you help us with the booth and come yeah. down? I'll fly, you know, I'll pay for your flight yeah. and, you know, you're going to work for us. And maybe you'll see some other companies that you like there. So I did it right away for free, went down there. We got along great. I brought some sales in, you know, I brought some prospects in right off wow. the booth. And the guy afterwards, we sat down and there was one other guy my age. And he said, okay, you know, in a software company, you need a salesperson and a product person. Which one do you want to be? (laughs) I picked the product person. So I started my career as product manager. And for me, it was all about product, what you were offering, how you put it together, what the user experience was, what the benefits were, how you explained, you know, the product marketing of it. 
um, how you explain and differentiated it in the market. So as a sales leader, I don't know any other sales leader that came from product. And that's what really makes me different and makes my experience different. And I try to leverage that all the time. And that's really why eventually I've been working in early stage and in go to market and in growth stage companies, because that's where the interaction between product and sales and the field Mm -hmm. super valuable to get that when, you know, to get that right. And so that's what I've been able to do over and over. But, you know, I started in product and I just found out that I liked being out with customers and prospects more. And when I had the salesperson sitting next to me and I was doing all the talking, I'm like, why do I need this guy? <laughs> just be the salesperson. They get paid more. So that's, that's, that's how I backed into sales. That's such an incredible story for two reasons. I was following your story all along until you got to the point where you said someone looked at you and said, do you want to be in product or sales? And I was just waiting for you to say sales. Yeah. I would not have, I would not have pegged you. For Never thought of myself as a salesperson. Some cliche thing that, you know, was in movies. That's incredible. And, and, and yet here's, the, here's the, the funny part though. I don't think I've run into a lot of product folks that have graduated from college, picked up a magazine, saw a wider industry trend, jumped on the first opportunity to put themselves at a trade show and bring in prospects as well. So I wonder, I mean, there must have been a, a little bit of an inkling in, in, in you enjoying that process. And you know, maybe knowingly or unknowingly, you at least had some baseline affinity towards sales. Would, is that a fair statement or do you think I'm reading into it too much? Yeah, I mean, I, so I grew up in my family's businesses. Um, my father's uh, Greek and, you know, they always own restaurants and liquor stores. That's what we owned. And so I would work there growing up um, and I would deal with customers all the time coming in. And I never realized it, but it was all sales. That's yeah. what it is. You know, it's, it, well, my version of sales, which is more about serving the customer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, yes, I didn't know the label sales, what that meant, but I think a combination of number one, I defined it my own way and did it my own way. And it seems to have, you know, differentiated me and worked okay, pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, number two, I, I guess when I was younger, I just didn't know what sales was. I didn't know what it was. I knew what products were and I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you, you, you made that transition, right? When you realized, hey, I am doing a lot of what, uh, you know, salespeople should be doing and I should make that transition. Uh, how was the first, you know, year or two years? Was it what you expected it to be given that now you've given it a formal label, you've taken on responsibilities more formally? Uh, was it a smoother transition or did you run into challenges? Well, I think, you know, the, the saving Grace was having a mentor because I didn't come up through any formal sales process at a larger company or something like that. I was at, in startups. There was nobody to, you know, nobody else there. There was no process. There was no onboarding, you know, that kind of stuff in most of the companies I worked in. So I always had either a founder or, you know, or in the early days, the head of sales. Um, I got lucky one or two times having someone who was able to um, just through working with them really mold, give me that foundational experience of how to, you know, how to handle objections, how to, how to map out a sales cycle, how to qualify. And uh, I was probably least good at those things. I was always one step behind yeah. other people who had like got out of school, went to work at ADP in the sales department, had a book of business, you know, was in the field Mm -hmm. had, um, you know, off sites where they had sales training and all that kind of stuff. I never had any of that. So I was always one step behind. And what really allowed me to keep up was a few good people along the way. That it's interesting that you, you mentioned uh, mentors. Uh, you know, we're having discussions with others, other sales leaders and other folks that have been very successful. And this, is, this seems to be a recurring theme, right? And I've, I've heard this a couple of times before. I think folks often underestimate uh, the, the need to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And the need to uh, learn from people that have been there, done that. Um, so thanks for sharing that. I think, I think more folks need to hear this. And I think it's okay to ask. Uh, it's okay to ask for, for help. And it's okay to look up to a mentor and you know, ask them to help you shape the direction of your uh, career. Uh, anyone in particular that you'd like to, you know, shout out to, f please feel free. We, we, we'd like to acknowledge people that uh, have been so you know gracious to you and given 
the opportunity for us to interview you. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, Darren Johnson, who lives in San Francisco and um, was a, a head of sales at Bloom Reach recently and just went to side as another C- C- CRO. But back then, 15, 16 years ago, he was the first one to give me sort of the keys to a territory and manage and be able to manage, you know, hire and manage others. So I think, you know, as an individual contributor, and I wasn't lucky enough to, you know, meet somebody like that as an individual contributor, but my movement into sales management was really uh, accelerated with his help. Again, you know, nothing formal, just uh, being out there doing it. And I built up a, a, a good sized team um, under him. And, uh, you know, we were acquired by a huge company, um, Amateur Adobe, and mm-hmm. you know, kept, kept going at that. And, and uh, yeah, so he's, he was instrumental. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so there's a turning point here, right, where you were an individual contributor, you were doing really well, and then you had to switch gears. And now you're responsible for not just your own results, but the results of um, a team at large. What was that transition like? Because I imagine, is it similar to you date someone for a very long time and then you get married in the conventional sense and nothing changes, it, you're just married the next day? Or was it a bit of a, a bit of a change? You wake up and you're like, oh, okay, I have a team today. Um, how, did, how did you kind of go about navigating that? Well, I think people do it in different ways and maybe that's okay. The, the way that I did it was really seeing, um, it, seeing those two positions as completely different jobs. You know, a lot of sales managers have succeeded by just being a super salesman, you know, super salesperson, mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, minions or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, come in and close the deal for them and all that kind of stuff. I've always sought to build um, a machine mm-hmm. that didn't need me to be, in, you know, in, in, you know, supervising every moving part of the machine. So for me, um, again, with a product background, product marketing background, uh, I was more interested in, you know, getting the the product and the proposition right, the strategy for go to market, get that right, and then you have, you know, a team who carries that that uh, positioning into market and, you know, change it when, when you see feedback and, and you need to change it, but that right. And having building a, you know, recurring revenue machine was always more important. That is a completely different job from selling. And, and frankly, I like the job better. I, I always, whenever I'm interviewing mm-hmm. people say, okay, you know, three, five years from now, which is your path or which of many is your path? Are you the you know, superstar, overachiever, you know, driving the expensive car salesperson, Mm -hmm. you know, a leader, a manager, or are you an operations rev ops type person? A lot of different paths you can go to from individual contributor. This is the one I chose. When, when did you, when did you know about that though? Right. Cause we, we often run into younger, very ambitious people that want to start out as let's call them a sales development rep, but in the back of their mind, they have an eye towards wanting to be an AE. The second they're an AE, they have an eye towards the next thing. Right. And although it does seem like each of those jobs are pretty different and to do well in any one role, um, you need to nail whatever is required for that role alone, right? How do you figure out or at least start positioning yourself in testing and experimenting whether that next role is for you? Uh, is that something that you did consciously? Was it through observation? How do you kind of structure that if you're you know, an aspiring sales professional? The best you can do is to have a plan and that plan is subject to change, you know, that's fine based on experiences that you have or things that work or don't work, but you got to have a plan. I guess, you know, I always think of myself sitting in an interview, you know, years from now and how I would, how I would explain, you know, it's the arc of the story, the storytelling. How do I explain why did you take that job? What happened, you know, in your journey within that job? What did it lead to? Mm -hmm. What, and then why are you here, you know, in this next, uh, next phase? So, I'm always thinking about that. So you have some plan. You need to have a plan because opportunities will come up. The sales leader is on a trip and needs someone to, you know, run the sales meeting while they're in the air. Mm-hmm. You the one that's going to step forward and take that and take that opportunity and have it go really well. Everybody gets back. They're going to say, "Yeah, we had a great meeting." You know, here's the update. You would never take that opportunity unless you had a plan. So those are the kind of opportunities that are going to come along and 
you got to step into them. Then, and not, not every, I'll say like, not every SDR should be an AE, you know, SDRs can go into any part of the comp, the company they want front of the ship. They are, you know, the first touch for any customer and therefore any revenue coming in. They can go into operations. They can go into marketing they can go into product they can go into leadership. They can go into operations or into, you know, carrying a quota and sales. You know, I'm glad you bring that up. Um, again, I think it dispels this notion that if you're an SDR, the only next step for you is to be an AE. Otherwise, you're, you know, it's, you're not thinking about it the right way, but I but I do agree with you. I mean, as a you know young 20, 21, 22 year old, if you're out there um, and you've built some discipline, rigor, a bit of analytical muscle, and just sheer stamina in, in pitching a product or service, uh, there's no reason why, to your point, you can't take that and apply it elsewhere. You know, one of the things that you had recently recently written about was you know it was about it was about kind of planning your life in some ways, but to me, it's a little more philosophical. You had re- recently written a, a blog post, and I wonder. If if that can be applied outside of you know FPNA or outside of just professionally from a career perspective, do you think we can we can draw some parallels where you're constantly readjusting, re- realigning as you get new data into your own personal life, life equation? Yeah, I think you know that, that's every time I do something new or try or go to a new company build, I, I write something and sometimes I post it you know publicly, but I always write something down as sort of like, what is this story? What's attracting me to this opportunity in this um, company, this product, whatever. The, pl- the post that I wrote about Cube was that, you know, I was one of those people stuck trying to forecast, you know, in, late at night uh, with my other executive peers trying to figure out how much we're going to sell next year, how much we should spend against it, how much we should drain down the, the investment money that we have, all yeah. those things. But really, the experience is that when you have to do that, whether you're running your life and trying to figure out what you want to do next or, you know, doing a forecast for a business, you need to be agile. And, you, and the fact is what, what makes me really attracted to the mission of Cube is that the product allows finance people to move faster and be more agile and have more insights rather than just copying and pasting data. Okay, fine. But the same in your, in your life, like I said earlier, you have to have a plan, but you have to be willing to, to be able to revise that plan. That's right. And, and take the consequences of the revision, you know, yeah. but, but also, you know, be open to you know, The worst thing ever is just stick your head down and just run right through the fire. Mm-hmm. The fact is a lot of times, especially in growth companies, there's a problem with product market or there's a problem with you and the product. You don't feel it, whatever. If you're suffering, you've got to change. You can't yeah, stick with something and, and this sort of heroism thing. You've got to be agile and, and make small, you know, make, take the feedback and make a change. No, that's, that's, that's kind of what you were talking about. Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. I think the way you, you, you put it is a, is a, is it a Nordic quote, always be predicting? <laughs> no, it's the, did I miss it? Did I mess no, it up? That clause was prediction is difficult, especially when you're talking about the future. Gotcha. So like, always be predicting is a, is a and Scott always be predicting with something I wrote because okay. you know, like the sales Glenn Gary Glenn Ross always be closing. I think it's always be predicting. And, uh, and also that's the main difference between an individual contributor and a sales manager. The sales manager is thinking about what's you know the, how to forecast what's going to happen and get ready for it. Whereas individual contributor, you're more you know following the path of the sales cycle. That's a good, uh, good Scott special. And I'm going to, I'm going to apply that to my own self, right? I think it's important to have a plan, but also constantly be predicting as and when things happen in real life, right? It's, it's being nimble. And I think the reasons why Cube will be successful because it allows people to be able to get to, to that point, applying the same philosophy to, you know, uh, your, your professional career planning or just life planning in general, I think will, will certainly yield invaluable results. Uh, you've, you know, the, the other question that, I've, you know, that, I, that I want to ask you, which and I think I read something online on LinkedIn today about this, the pinnacle of sales success, let's call it, right? Where you've made it to a, uh, as a VP of sales. Then it looks like there's, there's the chief revenue officer title as well. What does that entail? Is that another incremental jump? Is it just a change in title? Does it depend on the name of the company? How have, because you've done both and you, you've increasingly held more senior p- positions, but what are you getting for it? Because I, I suspect that 
your your level of responsibility just skyrockets uh, two or three steps higher. Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, re- it's an evolving thing. So the C something or other is uh, is an evolution. You have chief product officer, you have chief customer officers. W- what are they? You know, what what do those things mean? And the fact is there really isn't a definition that everybody agrees on and it's very fluid. The, for me, the big difference is for a chief revenue officer is it's, it's taking responsibility for the entire or for more of the go-to-market presence. And by go-to-market, I mean the outward facing parts of the company that face prospects and customers. Mm-hmm. Partners maybe too. So yes, you're running revenue, but you, it, it's, Uh, Let's just say it's not just sales. That makes sense. Kind of went back in time. We've gotten to a point now where you've shared a little bit about your journey and where you are today. You could go back again. You had one piece of advice that you would give yourself, a younger Scott, with everything that you've learned so far, what would that be? I decided a long time ago that I wasn't going to just chase the money, meaning salary or, you know, thick commission plans. And that's worked out really well for me. That was something grandfather told me when I was a kid, never take a job for the money, take a job to for the learning, for what you're going to learn in that. So, I mean, I followed that pretty well. And you know what? The irony is like the money comes. You yeah. Know? And of course, we've all read about that in What Colors Your Parachute or all these kind of books thing that I wish I told myself when I was, um, you know, 22 came, coming to New York was press for equity. It really is. It, you, you, you never know when you're going to be at the one that pays off big from a stock point of view. Yeah. When you press for equity, it's telling your hiring manager all the way up to the CEO that you're, you want to be a stakeholder that you want to act like like you're a stakeholder, like you're an owner in your job. And, you know, stock, okay, everybody knows that now. No one knew it in the 90s because no one knew anyone who made any money off a of stock. But I had a feeling it was going to be important. I didn't press for it hard enough. And I think, talk about, you know, benefits of, you know, of payout and stuff like that. I think it's a really significant thing. It doesn't cost the company anything mm-hmm. effectively. Especially yeah. if you're the only one asking for it, you know. <laughs> so, and I think that's something that's difficult for people in the beginning of their careers to, to position themselves at. So get some advice. People get, you know, talk to people who've been there, read up about it and understand what to ask for and how to, how to position it. Because all the wealthiest people in the world didn't get there from salaries. No one did. Yeah. There from owning a piece of whatever they were working on. I didn't believe that enough in, in my 20s. I feel like that warrants a separate uh, discussion in and of itself. How do you how do you have that conversation with a prospective employer? How do you think about equity? You know, I know that a lot of companies today, even if you come in as an SDR, they'll offer you some number of options, but most of these folks have no clue on what the cap table looks like or uh, what this effectively translates, you know, there are any liquid, liquid, liquidity preferences. I think these are things that, you know, we should probably talk uh, another time. I do want to ask you one more well, question. I mean, the, the, I think the important thing for, for a person who's starting out is not to get it right on the hiring offer letter. I mean, yeah. you're going to get what you can get when they don't know you and you have yeah. to work for them. The time to leverage for more is when you've done a good job and when you're in your review or when you're moving up into a new position, you can get it then. That's also a good point. You have a little more leverage at that point yeah, here. I guess you're leverage. a they want. proven commodity. The, the one other question, and I'm asking you this because you, you said something interesting. You said that you have never and you'll not continue to take uh, jobs based on compensation alone. Uh, it makes me think you're looking at other factors, right? Whether they're qualitative or quantitative. Uh, and this is the last question that we have for you. How do you decide on accepting an offer? Before we you know, started recording our, recording our session today, you, you talked a little bit about mission. I'd love to hear a little more about you. If I were you know, someone that wants a career in sales or I'm even a mid-career professional, what should I do and how should I evaluate uh, whether I should take a, accept an offer? It's upsetting when I look at some of the folks who have been on my teams in, in past companies who were um, doing really well with me at that time, but you know, they've stumbled a little bit and going to a company that didn't work out and, you know, in, and they were gone after a year and maybe they even, you know, stumbled and did that a few times in a row, which is deadly. So how do you, and, they, and the reason they did it was for title and salary. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that was the attraction. I know it. And that's where the mistake was. So the most important thing is that you have a personal stake, a personal, you can verbalize how you fit in with the mission. And by mission, I don't mean saving the world or doing charity. 
or you know um, equality or justice stuff. I mean the mission of the product mm-hmm. and the proposition and the people that you're working that are working on it. So that's for me that my checkbox is proposition first. What what does this product do? How does it help the customers? How does it help improve their life? That's the mission. The product does it live up to? Does it actually deliver that? proposition and can it do it over and over again? Has it, have they had renewals and you know, uh, customer advocacy? And the three, the, the last thing and most important, you know, uh, after you get all those is the, is the people. Can you work with these people? Can you trust them? Are they, um, your, are they, you know, your kind of coworkers and leaders, you know, the, the leaders. So for me, that, those are the checklists. And, um, you know, I get really jazzed up about the, the, the opportunity you know, like an investor would. I mean, you're investing your time. You're not putting money in, but you're investing your time and your time is the, is the most valuable thing that anybody has. So you are investing in that new position. So I would vet it in some way like that and, and figure out how you are a part of that mission and how you're going to get psyched up about that. Cause if you're doing it for the money or for the title, it's going to be low probability that you're going to get what you want. That's a, that's a really good framework. And again, thanks God for sharing these wonderful nuggets of uh, nuggets of information with us, you know, in, in our eyes, I think your credibility speaks a lot. And I think hearing this from you uh, would, would certainly mean something for all of our listeners in our audience. So once again, thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Great to see you. Yeah.